seems like not a whole lot has changed. Uh, politics is still the standing order in Louisiana. And gee, it seems like more and more Louisiana is becoming more and more the focus of uh, politics from all around the country. Just in the last uh, few years from our last presidential campaign, we had a one governor who just ran for president. We have another governor who's governor for president. And we have another governor who will be able to vote for president uh, now that his probation is finished. And, uh, and how about that? Edward Edwards can't run for statewide office, or he'd be running for governor, but he can run for Congress. There's no federal prohibition uh, against that. Uh, I, you know, there's some who think that he's just uh, desperate to uh, revive the, his reality TV show. Because this is, we're talking reality now, if, uh, running for Congress. It was quite a show. I don't know if y'all saw it. It was a it was a Trina production, and then she was some point during the show very heartfelt. She was talking about her relationship, and she was crying. I was crying too, but it was for a different reason. I had to write a review. So it's uh, but how about you know, a guy like Evan Evers goes off to jail, uh, writes a book. A uh, young woman, 50 years his junior, reads the book, falls in love. Come and meet him, and they get married. I mean, I wrote a book. <laughs> I, mean, uh, I call that the power of the pen from the pen. It's pretty good. Uh, but it also shows that something that we've had missing in Louisiana politics for a long time, and that's just some personality and some little bit of that character. And just when you realize how much you missed it, you have a guy like Vance McAllister that comes along and reminds you why we kind of moved away from all that. Uh, we invest a lot of a, attention and uh, respect and uh, expectations in our governors, probably more so than most other states. Maybe it's our colonial European past. Uh, but uh, here, I think I, I like to say that our heroes have always been governors. And sometimes, you know, for better or for worse, and it's interesting that we have now on the national scene both Edwin Edwards and, and Bobby Jindal because when I started out in politics, Edwards was the governor, and here I am uh, we, you know, 40 years later and we have Bobby Jindal. Edwin Edwards kept alive traditions of populism that were dead before he was born. Uh, and it seems like Bobby Jindal is now taking, uh, I'll be waiting for the day when I get to the Capitol and Huey's statue is gone. Uh, so uh, he is changing government that much. And, you know, there's similarities though. There was kind of the perception or the, you know, the, the talk that when Edwards was governor that Louisiana was for sale. And it seems now with, uh, with Louisiana state government is being privatized so much, we're selling off pieces of it one piece at a time. Uh, so it's, it's, but I tell you, another area where uh, this governor and that past governor have something in common is that currently what's going on in Louisiana government right now is we're you know, having a severe money shortage. Now, it's one thing to have a budget problem, but when you start having a cash flow problem, that's when you're in real trouble. And even this same way, I remember back in the end of the Edwards third term in the 1980s, um, they were sweeping every fund they could find just to make payroll, and it seems that here we are this time again. Now we're, we're to give an IOUs to the Treasury just to try to make it to the end of the fiscal year. Uh, and that's, um, I, I think that's due in part, this governor doesn't want to raise taxes, and so he's, he's trying to uh, uh, find any way he can to keep things going. Uh, and but it's 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 a interesting that uh, in the last poll that came out, Bobby Jindal's numbers were coming up, and it's that odd because it was at a time when he really hadn't done anything. And I think he's trying to figure something out. That in a little politics, that as long as you know you don't uh, you don't raise taxes and don't get indicted, you can probably do pretty well as governor as far as the people are concerned. There was uh, still the jury is out though on. Um, uh, whether or not Bobby Jindal's approach to health care uh, versus the uh, the federal approach to health care is going to succeed. His, uh, his popularity really fell a lot a year and a half ago when he had to start 
uh, talked about when he first started talking about closing public hospitals and privatizing care. It was very unpopular at the time. Uh, when the transformation took place, uh, people accepted it a lot more. I think some of our, our, our private providers have done a really good job in, uh, in stepping into the shoes of state government and running public hospitals. But it's just a question of whether or not we can pay for it. And that's what the, the feds still haven't told us, but whether or not that's going to work. And so it's, it's, it's kind of funny that we're going to you know, all this time the governor has refused to accept the expansion of Medicaid, saying that it was going to cost the state too much money in the long run. And uh, it's kind of surprising that he's worrying about how well the governor in 2020 does, uh, because uh, and uh, it seems like it's it's really for more his politics than anything else that we've done that. And but we've, the more we find out from the feds how much it's going to cost to privatize these hospitals, the closer it gets to what it would cost to expand Medicaid. So we'll, we'll see in the end whether Obamacare or General Care uh, works out being the best part of Louisiana. In the meantime, I think we'll be <clears throat> seeing less and less of the governor as we get into the last year and a half of his term. Uh, he'll be out more and more on the presidential campaign trail. And a lot of people wonder, what you know, what's he doing out there? He shows up two points in the polls. Uh, you know, he hasn't seemed to have uh, cracked that, uh, even the middle level. Uh, there's others that you hear four or five names get talked about, about Republicans running for the uh, presidential nomination. You never hear gentles. And uh, my theory is, is that he's not really running for president. He's auditioning for vice president. Now, he thinks that's his shot. Uh, and as opposed to having to go before primary voters, uh, to get to be vice president, you just have to impress one person, right? <laughs> just one person makes that decision. And it worked out pretty well with him with Mike Foster uh, 20 years ago. And so he thinks it may still work out for him again now. And when you think about it, it, it is a... Uh, a possibility when you think of the whole cast of characters of people who are running for the Republican nomination. Um, and if you assume that you know you got the front runners like Chris Christie and uh, 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 Ted Cruz and Rand Paul and, and Jeb Scott, uh, that if the Republicans end up going as they have the past couple of times with a more moderate candidate like uh, uh, Jeb Bush or um, uh, Chris Christie, that they might be looking for someone more conservative to balance the ticket with. And I think that's, that's, that could be Jindal's real shot. Uh, he, then you start looking at his competitors, the guys like Mario Rub Marco Rubio uh, and like that. If Jeb Scott gets the nomination, he cannot pick Rubio because they're from the same state. Uh, and that's against the Constitution. So uh, the more you look at it, the more Bobby Jindal's chances, maybe, of slipping in there and becoming the vice presidential nominee uh, really aren't that bad uh, once you look at it. So uh, uh, we have a long way to go before that happens, a lot of twists in the road. But it's just going to be fun to see a, a Louisiana governor out there uh, adding that to uh, Louisiana pol to uh, national politics. Before then, we got a big election that we're dealing with right now, with um, the U.S. Senate race, and Mary Landrieu, Bill Cassidy, and a cast of thousands um, is going to be, and the Koch brothers, uh, who have made themselves a fixture in Louisiana politics with their, you know, nightly attacks on Senator Landrieu. It's uh, interesting that even though the uh, Affordable Care Act was passed in 2010, it is still at the very top of the radar screen in uh, politics and is going to obviously be a big issue uh, in, the, in the race to come. And, uh, but my, that's, I really wonder about how much uh, that really will affect the average voter. You hear on the TV every night, oh, Obamacare is terrible, Obamacare is terrible. But for the average voter, for the people in this room, for the 20% who are going to be in the middle and who make up the decision, uh, most of them have private insurance or Medicare. And uh, my question is, are they going to be walking into the polling booth mad as hell at Mary Landrieu, or are they just not going to care that much about because it doesn't affect them? And I think a lot will depend on 
how uh, what what happens to health insurance premiums between now and the fall? Uh, if, uh, if if people feel that their own health care has has gone down or cost more, it may hurt her then. It could be an important election. Obviously, it's an important election because the balance of the Senate is at stake. And here's my theory: uh, Mary Landrieu can't lose in November. She can lose in December, <laughs> but she can't lose in November because they have three op Republican opponents. They're going to split the vote to some degree, and the Republicans are just not going to get over 50 points in the primary. She might, but more than likely, the race is going to be thrown to December. And here's the deal. What if the whole balance of the Senate is rest on the Louisiana election. You think we're seeing a lot of commercials now. <laughs> you know, you will be able to fill this room with the reporters who will be coming in for that race. And that would be a bad news, though, for Mary Landrieu if the race, if the balance of the Senate uh, hangs on her election, because then it will become a national election, a D versus R election. And in Louisiana these days, those races are going to the Republicans. Uh, if, however, if the, uh, if the balance of power in the Senate is decided in November and the December race, the Louisiana race in December is not going to make any difference as to who runs Washington, then the advantage shifts to Mary Landrieu. Because then you think, well, who's best for Louisiana? Who's, who's done the most? Who's tried the hardest? Who's a known quantity? Isn't it a bad, not a bad idea if you have a Republican to have a Republican senator and a Democratic senator. So those are the two two variables that uh, come election night in November uh, could, could make a big difference uh, to Mary Landrieu one way or the other. So I'm, I'm of course looking forward to that and then right after that we'll move right on in to the gubernatorial election of 2015. And, uh, for some people, I think they dread the thought of eight years of Bobby Jindal followed by eight years of David Vitter. Uh, it could happen. It's amazing that Vitter finds himself in this position anyway. Uh, but I think it just goes to show you that it takes more than one sex scandal to bring down a Louisiana politician. Uh, and uh, he, is, uh, he will be very formidable. Uh, it's one thing about Vitter is that he, he thinks and eats and lives politics 24 hours a day. Uh, and uh, he's going to run the best race he can. Uh, who runs against him? This may be the time, finally, that the Democrats show up in a gubernatorial election. Last two races, the Democrats have been missing in action in 2011, 2007. We couldn't even get a Democrat into the runoff. So uh, will it be different this time around? If, uh, if Mitch Landrieu up, ups and runs? Maybe so. That would be, I think, the contest a lot of people have been looking for, uh, David Bitter versus Mitch Landrieu. Uh, or if not, if he doesn't run, uh, Representative John Bell Edwards is out there. Uh, he has a good story to tell. Uh, his problem is that it's going to take him to raise a million dollars just to tell people that he's not that Edwards, you know, and then another two or three million to introduce and say who he is. Uh, so uh, either way, it's going to be quite an election for Louisiana coming forward. Things have changed a lot since I've been in, all, uh, in, uh, in writing about Louisiana politics. Uh, you know, when I started out, it was almost all Democrats. Now it's, uh, we still do have a two-party state. You have your Republican Party and you have the Tea Party. Uh, that's pretty much who runs things. And uh, when it gets right down to it, you know, it's usually the black vote that decides, uh, just like it did in the uh, congressional race up on Monroe this year. Uh, so there's a, that's what, uh, um, looking forward, it's going to be, uh, you know, I think those are going to still be those uh, real competitive dynamics that make Louisiana politics really special. When I think about the future of this state, I'm going to get into my career. and. Uh, things are in some ways better, in some ways not better since when I started. But I think of the things that are really going for Louisiana 
And this is the point where most politicians say the most important thing we have is our people. N not so much. I think the people are the problem. <laughs> you, know, you know, we have some of the uh, stupidest, least educated, uh, unhealthiest and, uh, uh, people in the United States, and they're usually dragging our politicians down. So uh, it's how do we deal with those people? I think the things that are really well going well for Louisiana, we got three things. One, we got water. Maybe it's a lot of times too much water, but we have water that uh, 20, 25 years from now, places like Phoenix and Las Vegas uh, will, and Dallas will wish they had. Uh, Louisiana has natural gas, which is the, the fuel of right now, uh, and uh, that more than uh, you know, our, our new ethics code is what's been responsible for this, uh, the uh, big industrial boom that is just getting started. And we've got the old stuff. We have a culture here in Louisiana that you don't find in other states from the plantation homes to the French Quarter, where you know they say in the French Quarter, anything goes as long as nothing changes. Uh, and uh, that's uh, something that, and I guess the you know, we had the French Quarter because we were too poor to tear it down 100 years ago and build something else, which is what they did everywhere else. Uh, but uh, uh, those are the three things that if we ever lose those, we're in trouble, and especially the old stuff, because they don't make that anymore. But uh, is, in, in if, as long as we still have that, people are going to want to be coming uh, to Louisiana, and I think we're going to have still a bright future to go. I'm going to go down to the legislature this afternoon. Uh, seems like there's not a whole lot going on there uh, this year. It's just because the less the governor is involved, the, le the uh, you know, the less fights they have. But they always they're saying something interesting uh, or just ridiculous. Now, I've collected some of them from over the last couple of years of the legislators who say the darnest things. So I'll just share those with you in closing about some of the things I've, I've heard that I think sum up some of the truths of Louisiana politicians, Louisiana politics. It was John Hilario who said, uh, good bills take two or three years to pass, the bad bills would pass right away. Uh, Danny Martini stood up once and said, please don't ask me any questions. I don't know what this bill does. <laughs> One who said, uh, talking about the bill about bridge tolls, he said, uh, this is just the same hooker wearing a different kimono. I like that, that's kind of nice. I have a picture of it in my mind, but I don't have it with me at this time. Uh, this is really a faux pas, to use a Chinese phrase. Uh, that was said once. <laughs> One old sheriff said, when I go throughout Louisiana, I carry a gun. When I go to New Orleans, I carry two guns, you know, just to be safe. And Robert Alley said, uh, I was treated like everybody else once, and I didn't like it. <laughs> Few of those senators do. The only way to dispute the facts is with figures. Remember that. <laughs> and finally, is one uh, in this business, you're only satisfied until tomorrow, and then it's another day. And that's politics for you. And I'm glad to be here with you today. I hope the rest of your day is great. Thanks a lot.